نستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار uh, So today's lesson uh, or the next lesson or two insha'Allah ta'ala is the explanation of the tremendous hadith of Hudayfa bin al-Yaman radiyallahu anhu one of the great companions of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and so this is with the with the sharh, the commentary of Sheikh Ubaid Rahimahullah Ta'ala and he will extract many of the benefits, the important points to be taken from this uh, hadith. And before we begin, just some brief biographical details of the narrator Hudayfa Radiallahu Anhu and he is uh, Hudayfa bin Hisal, Hisal, which is his father's name. Or Husayl, Husayl, uh, bin Jabir anent the end of his uh, lineage. Now he's famously known as Hudayfa bin al Yaman, and so the reason behind this name of al Yaman, al Yaman, is that uh, his father um, he <coughs> shed some blood in Mecca, and so he fled to Medina and received sanctuary or entered into uh, like an agreement or found sanctuary with a particular tribe a particular tribe and as a result of that he was called al-yaman meaning the one who has some sort of uh, agreement or oath or covenant and so he became known as al-yaman otherwise his name is hisl or Husayl. So that's the, that's the name, Hudayfa bin al-Yaman, radiyallahu anhu. And Hudayfa is well known for two things. <clears throat> uh, there are two things. First of all, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he confided in him the names of the hypocrites. So he was given some of the secret, that knowledge, which was secret with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was given that knowledge which clearly indicates that he is extremely trustworthy extremely uh, extremely honest and trustworthy and reliable and one who can hold uh, uh, secrets and keep that knowledge to himself and the second thing is that he is known for the one who has uh, memorized all of the knowledge of the fitan of the tribulations which are to occur in this ummah after the passing of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam until the establishment of the hour and we know that Umar bin al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu used to ask him used to say ana min al-munafiqin am i is it in your knowledge that i am from the hypocrites and he would say no he said no no, you are not from the hypocrites and I'm not going to give a tazkiyah to anyone after you. And we know that uh, he was given, uh, as we said, this knowledge of the hypocrites. And Umar also would ask him, he would also ask him, um, which... Or is there any of my workers, the people I've put in positions of authority, is there any among them who are from the hypocrites? And he would say, yes, one. Yes, there is one. And he would say, Umar would say, who is he? And he would say, I cannot mention. And then Hudayfa later he narrated that Umar actually... Um, stripped one of them from his position and it is as if Umar had been guided and directed 
to who that individual was. As you know that Umar was someone who was uh, you know, he, he was um, given, uh, uh, he was spoken to and he was directed in his knowledge and he arrived at many things which were, which were correct. And also when a man would die, Umar would go straight to Hudayfa and see, and see, would he attend the funeral prayer of that person or not? So if he attended, he would attend. If he didn't attend, he would not attend. Because he took that as a guide for himself as to whether that person was from the people of Iman or from the people of hypocrisy. And also we know from Hudayfa bin al-Yaman radiallahu anhu is that he... Uh, when uh, he fought in the battle of Nahawand, which is uh, Persia, in the conquering of Persia. And so one of the uh, companions who was the army leader, uh, al Nu'man bin Muqarin, when he died, when he was killed, he was the, he was the uh, commander of the army. Then it was Hudayfa who took the flag of leadership. And through him, there were many uh, cities or regions that were conquered from them is Hamadan, uh, Arrai is another region, Aydinur, right? All of these areas were conquered through him, which indicates that, you know, the, the greatness of his, of his companionship and his position also as a military leader. We see also that Hudayfa bin al-Yaman, we see in a hadith in Muslim, that he narrates that he, were, he was in a gathering with the messenger of Allah Sallam, and this was on the eve of the battle of the, the Ahzab, right? When all of the enemies, they gathered together in an alliance to come and attack the Muslims. And on that evening, it was extremely cold and extremely windy. And the Messenger of Allah said, Is there a man, ala rajulun ya'tini bi khabar al qawm? Is there any man who's going to bring me knowledge or information? about those people and Allah will make him to be with me on the day of judgment so the message repeated this twice repeated it three times and nobody responded because they, 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 they were fearful of this task because it was cold extremely windy it's also very dangerous to go to the enemy and to be with the enemy or among the enemy or close to the enemy to try to extract some type of knowledge or information about them. So nobody responded. So then the Messenger of Allah Sallam, he said, Qum ya Hudayfa. So he said specifically to Hudayfa, stand O Hudayfa and bring me some news from the people. So he stood up and as Hudayfa said, because he called me by my name, I had nothing uh, no other choice but to stand so then uh, he went and when he went Hudayfa says that when I started walking it was as if I was in a warm bathhouse you know you have the warm bathhouse so despite it being cold and windy when uh, when he went on the journey the cold went and this was like like a type of uh, a miracle or a karama for him as Imam al Nawawi explains, he says that he didn't find the cold that the people actually found because it was severely cold. And nor did he feel the severe wind either. And that's because Allah Azawajal, he protected him because of the barakah of obeying the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so when he went, he went and uh, he went and did whatever he did. He managed to extract or find some information and he came back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he came back, then once again, he felt the same cold that the other people were feeling. And so as Imam Nawawi says, وَهَذَا مِنْ مُعْجِزَاتِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم, um, This is from the, the miracles of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So also we know that Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, as we see in this hadith that we're going to discuss, that he would ask the people, that the people would ask the Messenger of Islam about the good and he would ask about the evil. And this is why he became the most knowledgeable of the people about the trials and the tribulations. We see in another hadith that 
He explains how he says that indeed I am the most knowledgeable of people of every tribulation which is to occur between me and between the hour. And he said how the Messenger of Allah used to confide in him with certain types of knowledge which other people did not narrate, only him. And also on other occasions he would actually mention things in a majlis, right? So not, not to privately to Hudayfa, but also in a majlis. And he would be in that sitting. And the Messenger would speak about the tribulations, the fitan, and he would count the fitan and he would mention them and he would say, for example, that there are three particular tribulations which will not leave anything alone. And some of them will be like the, um, you know, the fierce wind, when you see the fierce wind. And some of them will be minor and others will be major. So the different types of tribulations that envelope the people. And Hudayfa said that all of those people who would be in that majlis, they, they went, meaning they passed away, except for me. So meaning that there was a time when we, in which all of the knowledge was retained by Hudayfa bin al-Yaman because all the other people had basically, they had, they had passed away and he is the one who basically narrated them. And he also explains how that this knowledge that he was given by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu that it would be like he, he would remember things and then they would leave, he, he would forget them, not completely, but then when he would see certain things happening, then he would be reminded of the information given to him by the Messenger of Allah and he likened it to, for example, that when you have, when you know a man that you haven't seen for a very long time, but he's not in your mind, obviously, then all of a sudden you see him, then you recall, you know, who this person is because you know him from before. So in the same way, that knowledge of the trials and the tribulations that would take place, then he would, he would recall that information that the Messenger of Allah would give to him and he would recognize that this is what the Messenger of Allah was actually speaking about. So all in all, there is much more that can be said, but in brief, Hudayfa bin al-Yaman radiallahu anhu is well known for two things. Firstly, the messenger of Allah gave him knowledge of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, their names. And also, he was the one who was the most knowledgeable of the fitan, the tribulations to befall this ummah. And in fact, Hudayfa has narrated many, many ahadith on the fitan, on the, the trials and the tribulations. And so this is from the, the well-known ones. And so the Shaykh, Rahimullah, after Khutbatul Haja and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salat and salam upon the Messenger of Allah sallam, he begins by saying that, O oh, Muslim men and women, uh, he says, I know that you understand that the topic of this hadith, the, 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 the topic that this hadith uh, covers is extremely extremely important extremely important and urgent and this is because this hadith is from the jawami al kalim it is from the hadith which is short in speech concise in speech but very deep in meaning and it's from that jawami al kalim that the messenger of allah sallam was given and the sheikh says that before i start to present the hadith and extract various qawaid, principles, usul, foundations, we are going to read the text of the hadith. The text of the hadith. So the Shaykh mentions the version of Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, and also the version of Imam Muslim, rahimahullah. So we're going to read through the version of Imam Muslim. And so in the hadith there occurs, qala, uh, he mentioned the Isnad, Haddathani Muhammad ibn al Muthanna, Qala Haddathana al Walid ibn Muslim, Qala Haddathana Abdurrahman bin Yazid bin Jabir, Qala Haddathani Busr bin Ubaidilahi al Hadrami, Anna who Sami Aba Adris al Khawlani, Yakul, Sami to Hudayfa ibn al Yaman, Yakul. So he mentions the, the chain of narration to Hudayfa bin al Yaman, who said, Kan al Nas. 
يسألون رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن الخير وكنت أسأله عن الشر مخافة أن يدركني that the people used to ask the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم about the good but I would ask him about the evil out of fear that it may afflict me or that it may reach me فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So I said, O Messenger of Allah, إِنَّا كُنَّا فِي جَاهِلِيَّةٍ وَشَرٍ Indeed, we used to be in a period of ignorance, pre-Islamic days of ignorance in jahiliyyah, and in evil, شَر فَجَاءَنَ اللَّهُ بِهَذَا الْخَيْرِ So Allah brought us this goodness, meaning Islam and Iman and so on and so forth. فَهَلْ بَعْدَ هَذَا الْخَيْرِ مِنْ شَرِّ Is there going to be any evil after this good? قَالَ نَعَمْ He said yes. So I said فَقُلْتُ هَلْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ الشَّرِّ مِنْ خَيْرِ Is there going to be any good after that evil? قَالَ نَعَمْ وَفِيهِ دَخَنْ Yes, but there is going to be some Dakhan, meaning some uh, taint or some, some, uh, something defective or some taint. Qultu wa ma dakhnuhu. I said, and what is this? What is this taint? What is this thing? Qala, the Messenger of Islam said, Qawmun yastanuna bighayri sunnati wa yahtaduna bighayri hadi ta'arifu minhum wa tunkir. That there will be a people who seek to, who follow other than my sunnah. They follow a way other than that of my sunnah. And they guide themselves by other than my guidance. You will acknowledge some good from them and you will reject the evil. So they will have good and they will have, have evil. فَقُلْتُ هَلْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ الْخَيْرِ مِنْ شَرِّ and after this good, will there be any evil? قَالَ نَعَمْ He said, yes. دُعَاتٌ عَلَىٰ أَبْوَابِ جِهَنَّمْ مَنْ أَجَابَهُمْ إِلَيْهَا قَذَفُوهُ فِيهَا There will be callers to hellfire. Standing on the gates of hellfire. Callers standing in the gates of hellfire. At the gates of hellfire. Whoever responds to them, then they will throw him into it meaning into the hellfire فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صِفْحُمْ لَنَا so I said O Messenger of Allah describe them to us describe them to us قَالَ نَعَمْ he said yes قَوْمٌ مِنْ جِلْدَتِنَا وَيَتَكَلَّمُونَ بِأَلْسِلَتِنَا he said they are a people who are of our skin and they will speak with our tongue meaning our language قُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So Hudayfa said, O Messenger of Allah, I said, O Messenger of Allah, فَمَاذَا تَرَى إِنْ أَدْرَكَنِ ذَلِكَ What do you advise if that, if that reaches me, meaning if that time reaches me? قَالَ تَلْزَمُ جَمَعَةَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَإِمَامَهُمْ He said, you should hold fast to the Imam of the Muslims, whoever is the leader of the Muslims, and the Jama'ah, or the united body, that is, that is united uh, behind him. So then he said, فَقُلْتُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ لَهُمْ جَمَاعَةُ لَا إِمَامُ What if they, they do not have a jama'a, nor an imam? What if there isn't any body of Muslims who are united in obedience behind their rule? I do not find this. What, what, if, what if there is not the imam and the jama'a? قَالَ He said, Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَأَتَزِلْ تِلْكَ الْفِرَقَ قُلْ لَهَا Then shun or abandon all of those groups or sects. وَلَوْ أَن تَعَدَّ عَلَىٰ أَسْلِ سَجَرَةٍ Even if you had to bite onto the root, the root of a tree, حَتَّى يُدْرِكَكَ الْمَوْتِ وَأَنْتَ عَلَىٰ ذَلِكَ Until death comes to you and you are upon that state. You are in that state. Right, so here he commanded him to abandon all of the, the groups and the sects, uh, even if death reaches him. 
So this is the text of the hadith. And so the sheikh begins by saying that this hadith comp comprises many, many important uh, topics or subjects of fiqh, of comprehension, you know, which, which, are, which are mighty. And certain usul, foundations, waqawaid, and principles regarding the sunnah. So, this is the nature of the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This hadith being an example in that the sunnah has explained everything that Allah sent the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with and he would establish principles, foundations of the religion and he would direct the servants of Allah in terms of what they should do, whether in terms of speech, whether in terms of action, whether in terms of doing or whether in terms of abandoning, right? He left such clear guidance regarding all of the affairs that he left this ummah ala al bayda as we see in another hadith. قَدْ تَرَقْتُكُمْ عَلَى الْبَيْضَى لَيْلِهَا كَنَهَارِهَا I have left you upon absolute clarity. Clarity. Its night is as distinct as its day. Right? So this is the nature of the guidance that the Messenger of Allah Sallam, he left us. That's why in this ummah it is possible for any person, if he wanted to, to arrive at this guidance. Right? To arrive at the truth. Because it is, uh, it is Al-Bayda. This is how the Messenger of Islam, he left this Ummah. That, that guidance, that clarity, that uh, clarity in terms of uh, what a believer should believe, what he should say, what he should do, the tribulations he's going to face and which are going to appear. All of that is as clear as the night is distinct from the day. And you will find that the only people who speak and who bring this guidance from the sunnah are the people, are the people of the sunnah, the, 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 the Salafis, the people who follow the way of the Salaf. They are the ones who will mention these ahadith, whether it is this hadith of Hudayfa bin al-Yaman or the hadith which I just mentioned, Qad taraktukum ala al-bayda or many of the other ahadith that speak about the fitan that this ummah will, will encounter. Because we are seeking the clarity, the guidance, the truth. We want to avoid what the Messenger of warned us against. And so this shows that, that the truth is actually there for the one who wants the, who wants the truth. Who desires the truth. Who wants to abandon the ahwa, the desires and innovations. And so this is what the Messenger of Allah he left us uh, upon. And he said, لا يزيغ عنها بعد إلا حالك that the one who swerves from this or deviates from this, he is the one who will, who will perish. And so this is the nature of his guidance. And the Shaykh goes on to say that from the things that we take immediately from this hadith, first of all, is look at the eagerness of Hudayfa bin al-Yaman radiallahu anhu. This shows the depth of his knowledge, the depth of his knowledge, and the abundant vision and insight, right? He has plentiful vision and insight of the eyes and of the heart for him to be asking this type of question in that he asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu you know, what is it obligatory to be cautious of and to protect oneself from? And this explains to us that it is obligatory upon a Muslim to be eager upon this type of knowledge which is beneficial for him to be eager for that which will benefit him and to be eager for that which will harm him right so we don't address one and neglect the other one we are eager for what will benefit and likewise we are eager for that which will harm so that we can so that we can avoid it and he also says so this is the first thing the eagerness of Hudayfa to know the harm in order to avoid it. Secondly, the fact that he said, the people used to ask the Messenger of Allah about the good, and I used to ask about the evil out of fear that it might reach me. 
He says, the Sheikh, that this, although it might appear to be the case that only Hudayfa was the one asking about the evil, no, this is not the case. This is not the case. And the, it's not the case that there was no other companion. This is just Hudayfa narrating from his own experience that the people used to do this, and I feared that, you know, the evil, so I would ask him about it. This does not mean that there weren't other people and, you know, there weren't other companions. And also, uh, the fact that within the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam itself is to warn from every evil, right? To direct the people to every good and also to warn from every evil. The Shaykh uh, brings some other texts in this regard to prove this from them is the hadith of Amr, uh, Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As radiyallahu anhu that the messenger of Allah sallam, used to say innahu lam yakun nabiyun qabli qat illa kana haqqan alayhi an yadulla ummatahu ala khayr ma ya'lamuhu lahum wa an yudhirahum sharra ma yu'limuhu ma ya'lamuhu lahum so he said indeed there was no prophet before me ever except that it was a duty upon him to direct his ummah to whatever good he knew for them and to warn them against whatever evil he knew for them. So this is a proof that this is the actual nature of the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to explain every beneficial thing, every good thing and to direct the people to it and to explain every evil thing and to warn the people from it. And then also, we see that from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would inquire about the prohibitions just as they would inquire about the commands. Again, showing a concern to avoid evil. And so from that is the statement of Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu anhu, another great companion. And he said to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Dullani ala amalin yuqarribuni min al-jannah wa yuba'iduni min al-nar aw yuba'iduni min al-nar Direct me to an action that will bring me closer to paradise and distant me from the hellfire. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said Ya Mu'adh, O Mu'adh, indeed, laqad sa'alta an azimin. You have indeed asked about a mighty affair. But indeed, it is easy for the one for whom Allah makes it easy. You worship Allah, ta'budullah, wa la tushrik bihi shay'a. So you worship Allah alone and do not associate any partners with Him. And you establish the prayer, and you give the zakah, and you fast the Ramadan, and you make pilgrimage to the, to, to the house, to the end of the hadith, so this shows that the companions were eager not just for the commands, but also for the prohibitions. Another example, another evidence is the hadith uh, from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, who said that a delegation came of Abdul Qais and they came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and they said, O Messenger of Allah, we are not able to come to you except in the sacred month and between us and between you is this area or this region or, the, or this valley where there are the disbelievers of a particular tribe the kuffar of mudar disbelievers of a particular tribe and we we want you to inform us with knowledge which we can then go and convey to our people which will enter us into paradise give us knowledge which will enter us into paradise and which we can convey to our people, given that we can only come to you, you know, uh, rarely. So he said, Amirukum bi arba wa anhakum an arba. I command you with four and I prohibit you with four. So he said, I command you with Iman in Allah alone. And then he said, Do you know what is Iman in Allah alone? They said, Allah and His Messenger know best. He said, It is to testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and you establish the prayer and you give the zakah and you fast Ramadan and that you give one-fifth from the war booty you give one-fifth from the war booty meaning to Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam 
And then the four things which he prohibited were anhakum, anadduba, wal hantam, wal naqir, wal muzaffat. Right? So you mentioned four things that were prohibited. All of these four things are basically, um, these are things that people use as a vessel. As a vessel. So for example, a pumpkin, which is emptied out of its contents, and then it's used, for example, uh, to hold drink or to make nabiv or something like that. Right? Likewise, to use an earthenware pot, a pot made from earthenware, Likewise, um, uh, something which has been uh, varnished, like with a varnish, some sort of vessel with, with a varnish, and also to use, like you have, the, uh, you have the stump of a tree and you hollow it out to use it as a, as a vessel. So the Messenger prohibited all of these things. In some other hadiths, it's in the context of Nabiz. Right, of making a drink called called Nabiz. Right? So he prohibited from the use of these of these uh, vessels or taking these things as vessels. Now, this is just one example of many from the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to show a prohibited thing. So what is the maqsood? What is the intent behind all of these a hadith? Uh, one from Hudayfa, this hadith that we're discussing, hadith uh, from uh, Mu'adh bin Jabal from the great scholars of the Muslims, hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas, another from the great scholars of the Muslims. All of this is to show that the companions were eager to know the good and the evil, or the halal and the haram, or the commanded or the prohibited. And this is itself from the very nature of the guidance of the Messenger of Allah in that he came with commands and he also came with prohibitions. And he directed his ummah to every good and prohibited them from every, every evil. So the Shaykh, he concludes this, this point here by saying that the Sharia of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his da'wah, it comprises everything. It, it, it encourages people to do what Allah commanded. And the greatest of that is the Tawheed of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make the religion purely for him alone and then all of the other acts of obedience which come after that which are either wajib or which are mustahab right so this is the religion it is the tawheed of allah first of all and then everything which he commanded which can either be something which is wajib to do or mustahab that is the religion and then also on the other side it also comprises prohibition of everything which angers Allah, which displeases Allah. Or to put it another way, whatever Allah has prohibited and told his servants to keep away from. And so the greatest of that is shirk with Allah, committing shirk with Allah. And then it is all of the other acts of disobedience. And from them are the innovations, are the newly invented affairs which are the most harmful in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Shaykh then goes on to say that Shaykh al Islam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah has summarized all of this by saying, and then he quotes Shaykh al Islam, where he said, Wa aslu deen wa asasuhu amran. That the foundation of the religion and its and its pillar or its foundation is in two things. Al Amrul Awal, the first. Which is to call to worshipping Allah alone. To, to call to worshipping Allah alone. And then to encourage and to incite the people upon that. Then to have loyalty, to show loyalty upon that. وَتَكْفِيرُ مَنْ تَرَكَهُ And then to make takfir of the one who abandoned this. Right? So pay attention that our religion isn't just, uh, first of all, it's not just the knowledge that Allah has the right to be worshipped alone. Right? It isn't the ilm, the mere knowledge. Why? Because this is just something, it would just be something academic and intellectual it's just knowledge that you have right that's that's not what is the foundation of the deen it is to call 
to the worship of Allah alone, to invite to the worship of Allah alone. Why? Because it's the truth. It's the haqq. It's the truth. وَالتَّحْرِيضُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ And to incite the people and to encourage them and to emphasize that this is what they need to do. And this is where the da'wah of the people of Tawheed and the Sunnah is distinguished from the da'wah of other people. You see that they don't really, this isn't something that they call to and encourage and incite the people upon and remind people, right? And then not only that, it is to make al-muwalat fi, to make one's loyalty on the basis of this tawheed as well. It's meaning that we are loyal to those who are upon this way and upon this call and we are disloyal to the ones who oppose this way. So loyalty is an absolutely necessary uh, attachment or a condition tied to this as well. Right? And then, وَتَقْفِيرُ مَنْ تَرَكَهُ And then, the one who abandons this call to make takfir of that person. This is in general. And then the second half, الأمر الثاني والأمر الثاني الإنذار عن الشرك في عبادة الله To warn the people from committing shirk with Allah. وَالتَّغْلِيذُ فِي ذَلِكْ وَالتَّغْلِيذُ means to be severe and stern and harsh and strict. Just as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. You all know how he would reprimand people and correct them immediately. For example, a man said, Masha Allah wa shi'it. Whatever Allah willed and you willed, O Messenger of Allah. And the Messenger of Allah said, Have you made me a partner with Allah? Have you made me a nid with Allah by saying this? Rather say only Masha Allah. Say whatever Allah, say whatever Allah willed. Also the companions, as you know, when they were on the battle to, to the battle of Hunain and they saw that the pagans would you know have this uh, thing called uh, that and what where they would hang things from the trees and they said oh messenger of Allah why don't you make for us a that and what like they have a that and what and what and so the Muslim became really angry and you know he said indeed these are the sun and these are the ways of the people you know of the people who came before and he reprimanded them and there are many many other examples like that as well. So this means this is not a light matter. Which is why the people of Tawheed, the people of the Sunnah, they are very severe and stern in these issues of Tawheed, major shirk, minor shirk. Why? Because this is, this is the, 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 from the shirk, which is from the greatest of the, of the uh, acts of disobedience. And then he said, وَالتَّغْلِيلُ فِي ذَلِكَ وَالْمُعَادَاتِ فِيهِ then to have enmity on that basis. وَتَكْفِيرُ مَنْ فَعَلَهُ تَكْفِيرُ مَنْ فَعَلَهُ And then to make takfir of the one who does it. Meaning obviously with the conditions, with the establishment of the hujjah. Here he's speaking بِالْعُمُومِ Right? That we believe and accept. That someone who falls into the major shirk, then he is a, is a disbeliever. Right? We don't say, oh no, you can become a believer and then do whatever you want. Prostrate to an idol. Call upon the dead. You know, worship the sun, star, moons, enter into magic, and then you remain a believer. No. A person can leave Islam by, by falling into the nawaqid. Right? So, and then he said, so this is from Shaykh Islam, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah ta'ala, that in itself, you know, it, it summarizes the entire religion. And so the religion is founded upon these two, these two foundations. The Shaykh here, he Moves on to the next point, which is, what does the action of Hudayfa bin al-Yaman, what does it show? The fact that he asked this question, the fact that he asked about the evil, and he says that this indicates to us an affair which many, many people, they neglect or they fall short in. And this is to return to the people of knowledge, in this case, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He went back to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and uh, from whom he re received the sound belief, good advice, and comprehension in the religion. And this is also an indication to return back to the scholars, 
when we want to know the fitan, the tribulations, when we want to know about innovations, when we want to know about sects, when we want to know about groups, these are the fitan, the ahwa, which afflict the ummah. And so we return back to the people of knowledge whenever we hear or see, for example, a group appearing, saying something new, or bringing certain principles, or speaking with something, causing a commotion, causing a split, saying things that we don't really recognize. These types of things we go to the scholars, and uh, as the Sheikh mentions the, the hadith, wa inna ulama waratul anbiya. Indeed, the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets, and indeed the prophets do not in, uh, indeed the prophets do not leave neither a dinar or dirham as inheritance rather they leave knowledge they leave knowledge as inheritance so whoever takes from it has taken a tremendous has taken a tremendous portion so in general the point here is that in when, when these types of events or incidents occur then we go back to the people of knowledge and they will give us the solution they will give us the answer to the problem so they will clarify the issue from the quran and the sunnah and the way of the salaf then the sheikh was on to the next statement of hudayfa which is he said inna kunna fi jahiliyatin wa shar Allahu bihadal khair he said indeed we used to be in jahiliya and shar in days of ignorance and evil and then Allah brought us this goodness. The Sheikh goes on to say that this introduction here from Hudayfa, before he narrated, he mentioned, first of all, he said, what, what does it indicate? Inna kunna fi jahiliyatin wa shar. When Hudayfa is narrating this thing, remember, he's narrating to somebody else that we used to be in jahili and shar, and then this goodness came. And he's speaking uh, to the Messenger of Allah. So from this statement, we, we take, first of all, this is an indication, like a warning from taking the maslak of jahiliyyah. And the maslak of jahiliyyah is whatever preceded the call of the Prophet wasallam, from what the people were upon, uh, the Quraysh and other pagans, and what they were, uh, what they were committing of idol worship, and all sorts of deviations from Tawheed, believing in sorcery, believing in magic, believing in omens, um, uh, superstitious, um, you know, all sorts of uh, other kind of uh, uh, deviations from morals, from manners, uh, drinking, uh, intoxication, uh, different types of relationships, usury. And we know that Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, Allah, has a specific book called Masail al-Jahiliya, The Affairs of Jahili, in which he mentions dozens and dozens and dozens of different traits of Jahili that the people used to have. So we can refer back to that book. But this was the state and condition of the people. And this is what he said, that we used to be in Jahili, and we used to be in evil. And this is to warn the people from being upon those traits and those evils and the second thing is that he said Allahu khair. Allah brought us this goodness and so this what does this contain the first thing contains the warning the second thing contains announcing gratitude shukr gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledging his bounty and his favor because Hudayfa is acknowledging uh, having left jahiliya recognizing the favor and the bounty of islam which guides to all goodness and so he recognizes that uh, upon himself and upon the companions his brethren from the believers that allah gave them a religion and took them out of the darknesses into the light and guided them to the path of goodness and the path of peace and the path of safety and so everything that the messenger of Allah Sallam came with is khair, is goodness and everything that other than him come with or that came before him is sharr, is, you know, is, is, is evil and it comes from men, it comes from people. So here the Sheikh explains to us that we have a principle or a number of principles in our religion that when anybody comes and brings any qaida, any principle any asal, any foundation, anything 
then we have three ways of looking at that, that principle, right? This is after our knowledge that the messenger of Allah came with every good, every sound principle, every asal, every qaida, every, you know, all the rules, the principles, they are all found in our religion about everything, right? So for example, one can just go to an nawawis 40 hadith and within all of those hadith are many, many tremendous foundations of our religion, right? The first hadith about intentions, the niyyah, then we have the hadith of uh, the levels of the religion, Islam and Iman and Ihsan. Then we have the actions uh, about bid'ah uh, and, you know, man, uh, man, the hadith of Aisha. Then we have la darar wa la dirar. There's no, you know, uh, causing harm, no reciprocating harm. There are so many of these principles and foundations in religion governing everything, right? Our conduct, our relationships, um, everything. So that if someone now comes along and now tries to bring some principle or mention a qaida or a asal or something like this, then we have, we have three ways of looking at this. The Sheikh says, first of all, we see, okay, does this principle, does it agree with the Sharia? Is it in agreement with the Sharia? Is it in agreement with the Quran, the Sunnah or Ijma' or the understanding of the Salaf? Can we find this anywhere? If it is, then so Alhamdulillah, we, we accept sound principles because they have a basis in the religion. And if it cannot be found or if it opposes, this is the second, if it opposes the shara, the legislation, then it is obligatory to abandon this thing and to throw it away. Whoever this person might be, right? We cannot accept this principle which clashes with the Quran and the Sunnah. And if it is neither this nor that, which is the third situation, it doesn't have... Um, you know, neither agreement in the Sharia nor opposition in the Sharia. So in this case, okay, the, the people are at liberty to uh, abide or accept because there's nothing for or against. Um, however, the Sheikh says alongside this, we should try our best not to try and invent and introduce any principles from ourselves or establish any qawaid or usul. Because these things are already established very, very clearly in the religion, right? So, so either a principle agrees with the Sharia, good, or it opposes, so we abandon it, or it is neutral, neither this nor that. This, this, this issue is open and vast, but nevertheless, we should not be in the habit of bringing principles that we don't know are from the religion. Right, and we don't know whether they're right or wrong. This is not from the way of the people of Iman because the religion has come with uh, sufficiency. To the end of the ayah, that today have I perfected for you your religion uh, uh, and completed your religion for you and perfected uh, my favor upon you and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. All right, so uh, when we are put to trial by principles which have been established and things that people say then obviously we go back to the book of Allah the sunnah of the messenger we go back to text and to consensus whatever agrees we accept whatever disagrees we throw it away and the sheikh is going to give an example shortly of a principle that some people have invented inshallah just so we can illustrate this point uh, that people bring principles from themselves I'll mention it now it is this principle that when you criticize somebody and you want to warn from someone's evil, that you have to mention their good points as well. Right? This is called al-muwazana. Al-muwazana. This is something invented by the people of misguidance. Why? To conceal and to make light of their misguidance. That when you want to warn from an innovator or an evil person, they say, no, no, you have to, you have to mention all of his good things as well. Otherwise, you've wronged him. This is not right. Right? You know, uh, this, this defeats the purpose. Inshallah, the Sheikh is going to speak about this further down and we'll cover that in a bit more detail. But this is just to give one example to show what we mean here. Right? That the, that the religion of Islam has come with everything. So we will see, uh, as the Sheikh will now explain, that in the Sharia, there are severe warnings from certain types of people or certain types of groups. But there's no mention there about their good, about all their good things, all their good points. No. 
right? So when it comes to the, 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 the principle of warning from the evil of someone, it's not required for you to now mention all of his good deeds, how many umrahs he's done and how many uh, hajj he, he's been upon and how much charity he's given. You know, if he's a caller to, for example, Sufism or if he's a caller to some misguided uh, statement or opinion. No, you don't need to mention all of his good things because the whole point is to warn from him, right? So this is, this is not from our religion. In our religion is when you warn, you warn from that evil uh, because the intent is to warn from the evil and the perpetrator. And not to now give a, uh, praises and whatever else. And this is a principle in our religion. It's in the Quran. It's in the Sunnah. So someone comes along and says, no, no, uh, you, have to, you have to be just and you have to mention the good alongside the evil. Otherwise, you've fall, fallen into dhulm. This now is something new that has not been known previously to the scholars of the Muslims, to the Sahaba, to the Salaf. Right? It's something innovated. So we take this principle. Let's see, does it agree with the Quran, with the Sunnah, with... You know, um, and it doesn't. And so this will be elaborated in what follows. The Sheikh then goes on to say, after that, Hudayfa said to the Messenger of Islam, فَهَلْ بَعْدَ هَذَا الْخَيْرِ مِنْ شَرْ Right? So after this good, what is this good? It is Islam. It is Iman. It is Islahul Hal. It is a rectification of the, of the, of the affairs. Right? It is all these things that Islam came with and rectified this. This is the khair that Hudayfa is mentioning at the very beginning, right? Then he said, after this khair, and this khair, the scholars, they explain, is the khair of Islam, and then the khilafah of Abu Bakr, and then Umar, right? So this is the khair. So he said, is there going to be after this khair any evil? This is now the first question. And the messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, na'am. Yes, there's going to be some evil. Now, the scholars give various explanations as to what exactly this means. And from those explanations is that the, the evil referred to here is the killing of Uthman radiallahu anhu. Right? So the khair is Islam. So he said, uh, Allah brought us this good, which is Islam. And rectification of the Ummah. And in the Khilaf of Abu Bakr, and the Khilaf of Umar bin al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, anhuma. And then there will be evil. The message is, yes, there will be evil. And so this will be the killing of Uthman, radiallahu anhu. And then, <coughs> Hudayfa said, وَهَلْ بَعْدَ هَذَا الشَّرْءِ Min khair. Is there going to be after this evil any goodness? <coughs> and the messenger of Allah said, Naam wa fihi dakhan. Naam wa fihi dakhan. So again, the scholars they explain what is this goodness that is going to appear after the evil. And so again, they explain that this is referring to the khilafah. Of Ali radiallahu anhu. Right? So after the killing of Uthman, there's going to be some evil. And as we know what happened after the killing of Uthman radiallahu anhu, there was a civil strife between Ali and Muawiyah. There were some battles that took place. And uh, as a result of that, eventually uh, Ali uh, you know, became the Khalifa and he established uh, stability. And, but then there was some Dakhan. And so the scholars say this dakhan, in some of the views, is the khawarij. The khawarij, right? So the dakhan in the ummah now is the khawarij. And some other scholars explain that dakhan, dakhan means, it means hiqd, um, it means envy and corruption of the heart. Meaning that there's things which now are in, in the hearts. And this is what happened after the era of Uthman radiallahu anhu and as we know the khawarij appeared they had things in their hearts and now, now there's this dakhan which has appeared and so as you can see the sequence there's Islam khalis there's pure Islam and then there is some evil and that's the fitna of the killing of Uthman radiallahu anhu and then after that there is again Islam and there's goodness 
So this could be, there's numerous interpretations. It can be Ali radiallahu anhu followed by the Khawarij or Ali and Muawiyah and Umar bin Abdul Aziz in general, right, general goodness followed after that by, by evil Dakhan, which are the, the innovations like, like the, 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 the collection of the Khawarij, uh, the uh, Rafida, the Qadariya, the Murji'a and you know the various other groups that came afterwards, right? These are the Ahwa and the, this is, is the Dakhan. So here the Sheikh says that from the guidance <clears throat> what we can clearly see from this opening passage is that the Messenger of Islam clearly outlined and established that there's going to be ahwa, there's going to be desires which oppose what Allah sent him with of guidance and true religion. And Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, he asked this question because he already knew what he understood from the evil which is to come to the Ummah. So he asked this question and he raised this question and he said after that what is the Dakhan? What is the Dakhan? And the messenger said a people who guide with other than my guidance and follow a way other than the way of my Sunnah. Very clearly we know what, what is this immediately. It's the groups, the sects, the, the innovators, the deviants, right? Who are, not, who are abandoning his guidance. And so the messenger of Allah what we understand from all of this is that he, the messenger, has warned in a general sense from numerous evils that are to come in the future. And from those things which enter into this warning, even though many things enter into this warning, there are some specific things that we know clearly come into this warning in terms of what's coming in the future. And the Sheikh mentions a few of them. First of all, the the uh, in, in 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 general all of the innovations and desires but more specifically we know that the messenger of Allah sallam, he warned against al masih al dajjal al dajjal the one eyed liar and this is something that he mentioned and repeated many many times in other texts in other hadith and he repeated it and mentioned his descriptions and he continued and he would emphasize it over and over again until the companions they even believed that the Jal is almost about to appear and he actually is present among the date palm trees they were that that uh, fearful by the constant mention of the messenger of Islam we know this in general from other texts that the messenger would warn from these things that are going to happen in 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 the ummah right these are specific details even though in the hadith of Hudayfa it is mentioned in a general sense also the messenger of Allah he mentioned and warned from the Khawarij from their foundations is to expel Muslims from Islam on account of a major sin and uh, they threaten him with with killing him uh, or, or in fact the messenger of Allah he threatened that he would kill them if he reached them and he ordered the leaders of the Muslims to kill them if they come across them and they, they are in rebellion and there are many many ahadith uh, in relation to this he even promised a reward for the one who fights against them and kills them and he mentioned from their deeds is that they leave alone the people of shirk and they instead kill the people of Islam and from their traits he mentioned that they are given to worship and devotion to such a degree that he said to the companions you will belittle your own prayer compared to their prayer and your recitation compared to their recitation and he mentioned that the, the condition as well that they will leave Islam like the arrow passes through the game never to return back and they were not present in his time they came after his after his time likewise he mentioned specifically the Qadariyya the deniers of Al Qadar and he mentioned that they are the Magians the Majus of this Ummah because their statement resembles the statement of the the Majin, the Persian fire worshippers and because they denied Al-Qadr and by denying Al-Qadr they affirmed that man or there are things which happen in Allah's creation that man creates his own actions outside of, outside of Allah's control outside of Allah's dominion so in effect they've established two creators <coughs> a God of good and a God of evil meaning man who does evil you know chooses evil actions outside of Allah's uh, dominion and control 
And this happened at the end of the time of the Sahaba. And the Khawarij appeared also in the time of Ali radiallahu anhu. He fought against them. He killed them uh, until he put an end to them. And um, then after them, uh, other Rawafid. And the Sheikh mentions a hadith which some of the scholars in the past they uh, authenticated. But many scholars do not hold it to be an authentic hadith. But the Sheikh mentions that Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, he mentioned this hadith to be authentic when we look at all of its uh, chains of narration. And this hadith is the hadith, يَخْرُجُ قَوْمٌ لَهُمْ نَبْزٌ There will be a people who appear, يُقَالُ لَهُمْ الرَّافِذَةِ They will be called the Rafida. And when you meet them, إِذَا لَقِيْتُمُوهُمْ فَقُتُلُوهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ When you meet them, then kill them because they are mushrikun, they are polytheists. Right? So this is a hadith. Some scholars hold it to be authentic. Uh, others uh, don't. But in any case, here are numerous examples of specific groups, specific individuals, the Dajjal, uh, the Khawarij, the Qadariya, the Rafida, and then there's other hadith which mention, for example, 30 Dajjals that will come. These are false claimants to, for example, to prophethood. Uh, there will be liars. And all of these types of warnings we find exist in the hadith of the messenger, a hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the shaykh makes an important point here is that as we mentioned the khawarij and the rawafid, that this is only for the imam of the Muslims to fight them and to subdue them and to kill them. It's not for the average, not for any person to go along to sharpen his sword and to go out on the street and to know. Or with his bazooka as the shaykh says to go and no, this is not, this is not permissible. This is, this is for the leader of the Muslims, for him to engage in these, in these affairs. Otherwise, there's going to be uh, chaos and confusion and you know, turmoil. On, on this. This, is, this is only for the ruler of the Muslims uh, to, to do that. And also, the Shaykh goes on to say how the Messenger of Islam, he warned from the people of desires in general. Uh, the hadith of Abu Huraira, سَيَكُونُ uh, قَوْمًا يُحَدِّثُونَكُمْ بِمَا لَمْ تَسْمَعُوا أَنْتُمْ وَلَا آبَاؤُكُمْ فَإِيَّاكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ There will appear a people who will narrate to you things which you have never heard nor your forefathers. So beware of them and beware of them. Right? So this is people just narrating things upon the religion, and narrating hadiths, you know, which, 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 which are false, which are not true. The Messenger of Islam, he warned against that. In his, in his ummah. Likewise, you know the hadith, iftaraqatil al-Yahudu ala ihda wa sab'een firqa. The Jews split into 71 sects, the Christians split into 72 sects, and this ummah will split into 73 sects. All of them are in the fire except for one. And the companion said, who is that, O Messenger of Allah? And he said, al-jama'a, al-jama'a. And al-jama'a doesn't mean the majority. It means the group that is united upon the truth. Because as Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said, Al-jama'atu ma wafaq al-haq in ku wa in kunta wahdak. The jama'a is whatever agrees with the truth, even if you are one person. Fa inna ka antahina idin al-jama'a. You then, you are the one who is the jama'a. Right? So the jama'a isn't just a mass of people gathered together it is whoever is upon the truth even if you are one person if you are one person in a town or a region who is a sunni upon the way of the the, the salaf with the right creed upon exactly what the companions are upon you are the jama'a even though you are one person you are the jama'a which means that unity true unity can only be around you because of what you are upon of the truth that's the jama'a even if there are thousands of other people, this one is this, this one is that, this one is Tabligi, this one's Ikhwani, this one's Sufi, this one's Ashari, this one's this, whatever. This is, this is not the Jama'a. Because they are the very ones who have split the Ummah. How can that be the Jama'a? If you split the Ummah with your innovation and misguidance. Right? So as Ibn Mas'ud said, and the companions are the most knowledgeable of the intent of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. Right? So when the Messenger Wasallam said, al Jama'a. Who is more knowledgeable of what that means than the companions themselves? So as Ibn Mas'ud said, Al-Jama'atu ma wafaq al-haq wa in kunta wahdak. 
The jama'a is whatever agrees with the truth, even if you are alone. In that case, you are the jama'a. And then there are other narrations of this hadith in which it is said, Man kana ala mithli ma ana alihi liyom wa ashabi. Meaning the jama'a is, or the one which is saved is, that which I and my companions are upon today. So, what is the intent behind all of this? The intent, and we, we can finish on this point inshallah ta'ala. The intent behind all of this is, the shaykh says that the messenger of Allah sallam, he warned his ummah from everything that will corrupt its religion. He did so with a general type of warning, tahdiran aman, with a general type of warning, as you see in some texts. And he also did it with a specific type of warning, as you see in other texts. And until the religion remains pure, and until the sunnah is not mixed or merged with anything of bid'ah. And this is from the clearest of evidences, uh, uh, the truthfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in that he will preserve his uh, religion. And we know, the knowledge that we have is that we can clearly distinguish whether in terms of reports, whether in terms of beliefs, we can clearly say that this statement here, for example, we can say this statement of Al-Qasb, for example, this is a statement of the Ash'aris, they invented it, you know, in order to disguise the fact that their bid'ah is the bid'ah of the Jabariya. We are able to do this in our religion, right? We are able to trace back this statement here was said by this person here in this year or this century, and he said it because of this thing and the origin goes back to that thing. We can forensically trace all of this in our religion, which other, others cannot do, because they have a false religion, an altered religion, which has no connection to revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it is those who are the mushrikun, the polytheists, who have no connection at all, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the, you know, all various types of polytheism in, in Africa, in South America, in whatever it might be, or whether it be the Yahud and the Nasara, the Jews and the Christians. Yes, they can to a certain degree, they have, they have the, 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 to, to a certain degree, but because they have an altered revelation, an altered religion, then they are not able to, to do as the Muslims are able to do. And they are not able to you know, verify the correct religion that Isa Islam brought because they don't, they don't have, the, 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 they altered that religion. They're not able to do that. So as the Sheikh says, because of the perfection of the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallam, and because of these principles which are found in his, his Sunnah, which the companions acted upon. So the companions acted upon this knowledge in relation to what they saw of the Khawarij, the Rafida, the Qadriya, the Murji'a. Then, from then, this knowledge was inherited by their students, by the Tabi'een, and the Tabi'een, tabi in whose time came other things. The saying of the Jahmiyyah, the saying of the Mu'tazila, right, and many other things which appeared on, in the Ummah. And say, so they spoke about those things as well. And so because of that, we are able today, in the 14th, 15th century after Hijra, we are able to speak about our religion, knowing that there is nothing of bid'ah that has entered and merged with and corrupted the sunnah. We can say that with absolute certainty. But the Yahud cannot say that. The Jews can't say that. The Christians can't say that. Because, because, because their religion was not intended uh, to, be, to be final, then we see that their religion is, is uh, mubaddal, muharraf, it is plagued with innovations and they can't separate from you know, that which is true from that which is falsehood in a, in a uh, way which is correct and true and which can go back to transmission and which can go back to, they, they can't do that, they can't do that. And all of this is a sign of the perfection of the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is why we as Muslims, we are able to say clearly and definitively this action here is a bid'ah in our religion. We are, our scholars are able to say that. 
right? This action here is a bid'ah. It doesn't agree with the sunnah. And we are able to say this statement here is an innovation. It is misguided. It doesn't have a basis in our religion. Our scholars are able, or the scholars of Ahlu Sunnah, Wal Jama'ah, who are upon the way of the Sahab, the way of the Salaf, they are able to say that definitively with evidence. And this is what is meant when the messenger of Allah when he said, Qad taraktukum ala al -bayda. I have left you upon absolute clarity. It's night is like it's day. And that's why we as Muslims who follow the way of the Salaf, we are able to say definitively and speak definitively about everything which opposes the guidance of the messenger of Allah and which is why you see the people will often have great hatred and enmity towards the people of the sunnah and name them and label them with all sorts of names because they can't handle the fact that their misguidance or their error has been established with evidences and so they're not willing to let go of that misguidance and so they fall into arrogance and envy and jealousy and that, that hiqd which, which entered the ummah after the time of the khawarij Right, the hearts became tainted. Right, they weren't desirous of the truth as they were in the time of the Sahaba. And so you see these things, people not willing to let go of falsehood because of hisbiyah, because of partisanship, because of envy, because of jealousy. And they don't like to be corrected and told the truth because they don't have that desire for the truth. Because it's dakhan. Because there's something present in the ummah now. Right, and only he is saved whom Allah gives tawfiq to whom Allah gives ni'm, you know, he favors. And so this is why we should see this as a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that we in the 14th, 15th century, uh, we, can, we can definitively say that this is the way of the salaf. This is the way of the companions. This is not the way of the salaf. This is not the way of the companions. And this is a sign that this religion is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so with that, we'll conclude. Uh, we're roughly about halfway through uh, the, 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 the Sharh inshallah will complete it inshallah ta'ala in the next lesson. So with that we'll conclude today's lesson. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.